Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming in such a wonderful, great number. And as you heard from Kim Kanjang Nim, the title is Mind Over Time, Evolution or Devolution? That is our question. First of all, let us look at the comfortable, wide open range of history. We have a very good margin, 2,500 years. 2,500 years ago, the Buddha was born, attained enlightenment, started to teach us, and look at the result. Here we are. Not only us, many other religions. I mean, 500 years after him, Jesus came. 600 years after Jesus came, Muhammad. Uh, many other founders and re-establishers came to various traditions, including ours. Like a thousand years after Buddha, Bodhidharma came. Six generations after him, the sixth patriarch. And thus, the teaching spread north and south, many, many countries and places. What does that give us? It gives us a historical perspective. And one can ask the question, was our situation very different 2,500 years ago than now? And if you look, human beings face exactly the same problems now and then. How is that possible? Didn't we grow? Didn't we understand something? After the Buddha started to teach us, didn't more people get enlightenment? And the answer is that they did, indeed. When the Buddha started to teach us, suddenly five bhikkhus appeared, and then a whole sangha of 1,200, and then later on, hundreds of thousands and millions of people, their students, but yet, the situation on this earth did not change significantly. We are dealing with the same problems. War, famine, poverty, the small elite versus the huge you know, commoners. So can we say that actually nothing happened? That we didn't change at all? But the answer is very simple. Imagine life and this world without the Dharma. And you don't have to go that far. Just go a thousand years back in Europe. We call that the Dark Ages. We had that, and if we are not careful, we might have it again. So it's very easy to devolve back to something darker, back to something less one and more dualistic. But the situation is that we have been reproducing suffering, that is, ignorance, anger, and greed, way faster than we could have produced an enlightened society. For some time, for a few hundred years, in each continent it worked a little bit, like the Shila dynasty here in Korea, and more or less the same time the Tang dynasty in China. And almost the same time in Europe, but much shorter, what we call the Caroling Renaissance. So, there are times when society is more enlightened, and we produce less anger, desire, and ignorance to each other. But these short periods of time, they are over very quickly. Why? Because it's not in the interest of the elite to keep society enlightened. And that's when we come to the present day. We seem to have a lot more freedom than before. Definitely the freedom of information is right here. You just flip a switch and you get tons of audiovisual material, hundreds and thousands of books mostly for free. You can read, you can watch, you can listen. We wanted it, we got it. But please don't be fooled into thinking that this would change something on this earth, essentially. Maybe if we have too much information, it will get a little worse, as it did with internet addicts. There are special clinics for internet addicts. And maybe later there will be departments by domains. You are addicted to this homepage, you are addicted to that homepage, and everybody who is addicted to the same kind of homepage is in the same ward. 
It will happen if we are not careful. So, perhaps we can agree that on this earth, we always relapsed back into a level which we can call the great human average. And this great human average, no matter how much it bothers us, is always here on this earth. Especially when human beings just multiply in such a great number and our mind quality does not improve. So, we always talk about overpopulation. Yet, most of the land areas like the deserts they are not populated yet. Very few people live there. Most people on this earth live either on coastlines or in very well inhabited foresty subtropical areas. We avoid the extremes like the poles or the equatorial climate or the desert. But yet 7 billion people just proved too many already for our dwindling resources and overstretched you know, social problems. So the other part of the equation is, if our mind quality does not increase, we will start to do the same thing to each other as in the Middle Ages or any other time and place on this planet. In other words, we start to kill and we start to rob and we start to conquer just because we didn't know better. We were not more enlightened than that. And that's up to us. It's totally and absolutely up to us what we do with our minds. Whether we choose to evolve and evolution goes towards oneness, towards attaining our true substance, towards enlightenment, these are all one and the same thing. Or we devolve into the entropy of zeros and ones, and we keep our anger and desire and ignorance at the current levels or even increase that. We can devolve as well. Moment to moment you make choices, you make decisions and that either brings you higher or pushes you lower. Uh, most people, we blame our conditions. So my conditions are such my relationships are such that I have to behave like this. That I have to do this. I have to make ends meet. I have to make money. I have to fight. I have to compete, etc., etc., etc. And you cannot mitigate the fact that the cause and effect relationships you are subject to, you can see them, but you don't want to actually be responsible for them. So this kind of responsibility comes first when your views don't work. When your views actually stop being relevant to the world. And that kind of dissociation, that kind of irrelevance can make people crazy. Totally and absolutely closed in their own world. And when the problems come, it just pops and people become dysfunctional. They cannot relate to each other. They cannot really take care of themselves, and least of all can they help another person. And this kind of dysfunctionality, this kind of unclarity, this kind of ignorance is the best for anyone to manipulate human beings. When you're not conscious, when you're not aware, then you're subject to anybody's will with higher awareness, stronger willpower, and sometimes a very sinister intent. So you choose whether you evolve or devolve. You choose whether you want to be more enlightened or less. And even uh, in the Sixth Patriarch's time, in Hui Neng's time, uh, being a monk was not a guarantee that you would evolve, that you would develop. Remember how he got transmission. He was just a hengja, he was not even a monk. But when he put his poetry on the monastery wall, the fifth patriarch recognized that this man, no matter what he looks like and who he is right now, is the sixth patriarch. So publicly, he used his shoes to scrape off the poem from the wall. But at night, he gave him secret, trans secret transmission. And Huineng knew he had to escape. 
And Heim Young, the former general who became a monk, was pursuing him for the relics of the Buddha. And he wanted to catch him, disable him, or even maybe kill him, take the robe and the bowl, and then become the sixth patriarch. Because at that time there was just a monopolistic tradition in terms of transmission. Only one line. The sixth patriarch changed that. So Heim Young is pursuing Hui Neng, and Hui Neng sees that there is no chance. He's going to be caught, and something really bad could happen to him. So he puts the robe and the bowl in a rock and hides. And Heim Young catches up with him. He doesn't see him, but he sees the relics he came for. So he tries to move them, to pick them up. But they're just as immovable as the rock on which they were placed. So then, Heim Young got very frightened. His views didn't work. His inner world got shattered. The universe didn't really follow him. He had to follow something greater. And that's when he said, Younger brother, I don't mean to hurt you. I didn't come here for the relics. I came here for the Dharma. Look at that change. So then, the sixth patriarch, or Hui Neng, who wasn't really enthroned yet, he comes out of hiding and Heim Young says, please, younger brother, teach me. Then Hui Neng says, when you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? When Heim Young heard that, he woke up and he asked, younger brother, is there any other secret teaching that you got from the fifth patriarch? And Hui Neng says, no, what I have said is complete and to the point. And then Heim Young said, if so, then I would like to become your student. Then Hui Neng said, if you have this mind, then we are both the students of the fifth patriarch. And they separated. Of course, Hui Neng took the robe and the bowl, but he broke the bowl later and tore the Buddha's kasa apart and burnt it. He says, no one should ever be in danger for these objects. And he gave birth to five schools. Five schools which are relevant even today. One of them disappeared, the Unmun or Yunmen school that disappeared. The other four, through various transformations, are still alive. The Imje or Linchi school is the origin of Rinzai in Japan. And the Soto was originated by the Jo Dong, you know, um, Cao Tung school. And um, what is fortunate in Korean Buddhism is that the origins come from before the sixth patriarch and the sixth patriarch himself. Well, this question which the sixth patriarch asked from Heim Young is actually the origin of our Kan Hua Son or Hua Du Su Heng. Because if you make it shorter, you take away this, when you don't think of good and bad, then remains the question, what is your original face? Before even your mother and father were born, or even you were born, or what is your true face? Even shorter, what is this? Now, when you turn your mind's energy inward and you're not attached to the senses and you don't follow your judgments and you're not lost in your memories, when you can switch off your conceptual thinking, your CPU inside, then your Huadu, this great question, begins to function. It will render your mind clear like space, clear like a mirror. And in this mirror, you can perceive. That's the evolution of the mind. If we cover it up with sensory perceptions, attachments, ideas, dualistic views, resulting anger, desire, all this results in this heavy karmic layer, which is like mud over gold. And if you don't clean that up, then we can even make it thicker because we even lose the notion that there was something different from this mud of zeros and ones. 
from this thick layer of audiovisual and cognitive information which you get on any LCD screen, whether you are in the subway, in the Mogyoktang, or at home, or on the KTX. There's nothing wrong with an LCD screen. So don't be a Luddite, those people who destroyed machines in the 1700s, because they believe that they're taking away their work. The machines didn't. Those who controlled the machines, they did. Don't blame the LCD screen. Don't break any monitors. Just please be aware that there are people whose interest is to keep you in ignorance. Because then you are very easy to control and manipulate. It's very clear. So far, history never existed without this duality. The few that were up there and that were trying to rule, sometimes covertly, sometimes openly, and those who were sometimes conscious and sometimes less conscious of their choices. And that's us, the many. In America, the elite is called out-of-sighters, those people who you don't see. You never see them because they have their private world, from private tuition to private jets and helicopters and hotels, which you don't see and you don't get to. So they seem to live in the same three-dimensional space and the same one-dimensional time, but in fact they are very separate from us, and that's the way they want it. What I'm teaching here is not conspiracy theory, please don't take it like that. But it's just the way things are, whether it was the Roman age or the Greek Empire or uh, the Ottomans or the Habsburgs or any kind of empire, or if you look at China the way it works these days. So some people have fighter jets on display in their offices and some people are working for $60 a month. You heard it right. Chilmanon, for your whole work, a month. You can't put them on the same planet the way they live. Yet we are on the same planet. And, uh, you know, some of them believe that if capitalism becomes more in inclusive, inclusive capitalism, that actually can help. No, it doesn't. It doesn't help. By itself, it can mean some change, but it's not as significant as you waking up. So that awakened mind cannot be substituted with anything. That's why we have to begin with ourselves and choose to evolve. If not, we will definitely collapse as a human civilization and as individuals we can fail. Now don't let that happen to yourself. And the way is before us. So temples are not just for worship, although there's nothing wrong with worship. Just please don't think that your spiritual path stops with the religious view and the religious practices. It doesn't stop there. You can make one more step and instead of just praying to Kwan San Bosal, become Kwan San Bosal, become the representative of compassion. Instead of just praying to Munsu Bosal, become wisdom. Instead of praying just to Deheng Boyon Bosal, become helpful and selfless action. And instead of just praying to Jijang Bosal, be the vow itself. Be loyalty and commitment and responsibility itself. You can do this. We are capable of immense changes and transformations even within one lifetime. Although sometimes we believe only individuals can do that, like Jesus or Gandhi or people of that magnitude. We all have the same potential, but we don't have the same karma. And because of that, we have all different kinds of approaches and we need many kinds of traditions and many kinds of teaching. And we are lucky because in Korean tradition, you have everything you need. You have the scriptural studies, you have the devotional layer, you have the practical and meditative layer, you have the interactive you know, practice when you actually talk to Sunims or talk to Popsas, and then these teachers can help you. So Korean tradition doesn't miss anything, is not lacking in anything. What you look for, you can find, and that's wonderful. 
If you have any questions in that regard about evolution or devolution, time and space, human beings, us, feel free to ask. I have two questions. The first one is what is the difference between devolution, devolution and creation? The first answer is it's like going to two opposite directions. Evolution means that we choose a direction and we follow it. Creation is something you cannot really define outside of your own cap capabilities and creativity. In other words, it's useless to argue whether we created ourselves or someone, something created us. The answer is, as we are right now, we have free will, we have creative potential, and we had better become aware of it and use it. This awareness, as we attain that, is evolution. And as we are losing this awareness en masse, that's devolution. Second question? Uh, second question is, uh, uh, you said the desert uh, uh, technology uh, could, uh, could uh, help the, uh, the raindrops. Uh, in the end, the desert will be changed to a futile land. Uh, I think technology uh, has uh, much to do with uh, religion. Uh, what, what, do th what do you say of this? Men or human beings created both. And technology was a reaction to religious dogmatism. If you look at European history, Science came as a reaction to the dogmas that burned Giordano Bruno and almost burned Galileo Galilei. And then people started to use their own eyes, their own ears, their own thinking, and started to have experiences that were provable. You could repeat them, you could rationally explain them. That's how science was born. But science and religion, they are two departments of the same huge ministry. That's us on Earth. And technology itself is empty, just like religion. And that emptiness is our chance to use it for whatever we want it. If you want, you can have direct democracy when everybody's voting for every single thing on their computer with their national ID. And if you want, you can have a surveillance state, as the NSA scandal has just proven it, that all this technology is used to tie you down and spy on you. So it can either liberate you or make you a slave. But technology itself is empty. Human beings operate it. And the way we operate technology, that's the way it will work in our lives. Religion is the same. What kind of God do you put on top? What kind of supreme view do you follow? What kind of practice do we actually do? So religion by itself is a mechanism that we are selflessly following something greater than us or someone greater than us, by itself is empty. It has no self-nature. It has no direction, no content. We decide what we put into it. We decide what we believe. Any other questions? Uh, my question's kind of in two parts also. Okay. First being you mentioned that uh, the elite don't want I guess the commoners to have enlightenment. So why would that be, if that kind of leads up to, you know, like a more peaceful and mindful society, why wouldn't the elite want the commoners to be enlightened? And second was that- Hang on, don't forget your question because I certainly will. So, very good question, the first. And the answer is that if the soldiers want meaning in their lives, they need a military doctrine and wars to fight. If the leaders, like politicians, want to make themselves useful, they need problems to solve and prove how useful they are in a country. So if they don't have problems, they make them. If they don't have wars, they make them. The Tang Dynasty in China was an excellent example. Almost lasted 400 years. 10% of the country were monks or lay people living in and near temples directly involved in Buddhism, not doing anything else. The country was on the middle way. The country had a balanced budget, no big debts. 
no big warfare inside. It was as peaceful as, as great as it could be at that time. And the last Tang Dynasty emperor sent home 800,000 Sunims to become lay people, closed down 14,000 temples, died a violent death, and after that there was war. Why? Because they felt that they have no job. So the political, financial, and military elite began to feel that they became irrelevant because society, as you said, became too peaceful. So the answer really is that if leadership can be selfless, if leadership can understand the meaning of mu we, non-action, then they cannot really or should not make things worse. Okay? And instead of non-action, these days we see lack of leadership. It's not the same. We see laziness, we see ineptitude, we see incapabilities. Katrina, 9-11, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, does, does this seem to you very familiar, how we are mismanaging our lives on this planet? So, when you look at leadership, they don't understand that if there is a non-dualistic state for society, we could actually stay there, just don't mess it up. And that means non-action. If something's good, don't mess it up. That's mu we. And when you act in order to preserve the oneness, the enlightened state or the balanced state, whether an individual or society or family, we call this wei wu wei in Chinese, which means acting non-action. We mu we, okay, in Korean. Now this is really important, and that's what leadership usually doesn't understand. They want to prove that their ideologies are working. They are totally submerged in their own self-importance, and they want to make things different from before at all costs so that they could control it. So please don't have rosy dreams about leadership because we don't have enlightened leadership on this planet as yet. But either we have it, or we will not have social structures at all in a matter of decades. So either leadership becomes qualitatively different, and we begin to do very, very different projects, except for spending like half of the Earth's national output on warfare, whether it's just weapons or actual war. Ultimately, empires that go into warfare too much, they go bankrupt. Spain is a good example, 17th century. France almost got there, but the world wars came sooner. But definitely, the, the Turks can understand this, okay? And now, America is understanding it as we speak, with $16 trillion debt and counting. So, in 20, 25 years, either the United States totally changes its attitude towards its own citizens and the world and begins to think totally different or it goes bankrupt and disappears as, a, as an empire to count with. So it seems that over centuries we were making the same mistakes. Whichever country became an empire just went down pretty much in the same way and none of them believed that it's coming. The Romans never believed that those martyrs that they were crucifying all along Italy, or Rome at that time, the Roman Empire, that these can turn polytheism into monotheism in 300 years. And that's what happened. In 315, Constantine the Great issued his act of indulgence because he had no choice. He can't crucify his whole country. In another 70 years, there was the big uh, synod in Nicaea, Nicaea in, in Latin. And that's when the Bible was formed as we know it. That's when they edited out all those things that they didn't want you to know. And the current canon was born and heretics suddenly appeared because they were classified as such. I mean, her heretics existed before, but until, until like the end of the third century, it didn't become so serious. Later, it did, okay? So, let us keep ourselves supremely clear. As long as we have self, we have ego, there are interests. 
And these interests, if they can be exerted with the help of infrastructure and military and financial means, they will be exerted and enforced. It's up to you whether you wake up from your dream or not. But if we don't, we are facing a very, very grim future. Second question? Uh, Soon. And the second question was, um, you seem to very much emphasize that, you know, the common people, yeah. the, the enlightenment is very important for the common people. And the impression that I got was the kind of the whole approach to enlightenment of society is very like bottom up where, you know, the commoners are more enlightened and hopefully that will influence the elite. Um, but if, you know, just say the elite um, composes like 1% of the society, which is probably a very large estimate, isn't it much more uh, convenient, I guess, to convince the 1% to be enlightened with, as opposed to convincing the 99% to be enlightened? Uh, very good question. If you quote me about the commoners, you should also quote me about the enlightened elite. I also talked about that. That in the short run, that's our only chance. Remember, I said that either we have very different mind in the leadership that is more enlightened, or we can say goodbye to the next 30 years as human civilization because we will slowly devolve into chaos. So, whereas it would be very convenient, there is a very important notion. The problem with the leadership is that they're not listening because they have the power. And powerful people don't listen because they don't have to. They feel they don't have to. Their egos are very tight, very closed. And since they think they can control, they think they have everything. The two are going together. Whereas they really don't have anything. Revolutions and big disasters, imperial collapses, they have shown that very clearly. So it would be really convenient. But your own freedom, your own mental awakening cannot come from above. It seems very convenient, but no one can do the job for you. It is true that this 1% would really, really have to do it so as to make things better on this earth. But they won't do that. Face it. They don't suffer. They don't have the notion of suffering because they shield themselves from impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection. And when that happens, you cannot teach them. So because of that, the Four Noble Truths are paramount. The fact of suffering. If we don't acknowledge the fact that we suffer, we are unteachable. Because then we want to know the cause of suffering, then we want to end suffering, and then we are interested in the way to end suffering. And if you don't have the three marks of existence burnt into your heart, you will never listen. And that's why these folks don't. Save a few, but it's not enough. Okay. Uh, Sam, I will have two questions, more exactly one question and one remark. The first is, the suffering you speak, it's not question of money, it's question of human condition. Everybody is afraid, for example, from dying, from sickness, from old age. So I think these rich people, they have the same problem than everyone. Um, what you're saying is a generalization. When I said the, the elite is not listening because they don't have the notion of suffering, I don't mean they would be immortal. I meant, since they can afford not to listen, and a pretty large part is a financial thing, that they have enough money for super health care, for transplants, for many things that prolong their lives, they don't care. So their ignorance is largely dependent on their financial situation. And I don't mean that for everybody, dying is not a problem. I mean, birth, old age, sickness, and death. The Buddha classified it as the four misfortunes. We are there. But when we talk about the specific group of people, like very powerful soldiers with huge stockpile of weapons, they believe that they are invincible. And that notion of invincibility is the root of their ignorance. 
Okay. I understand now what you say. Other and questions? The second thing is, at the beginning of your talk, you make an equival equivalence between Jesus and Mahomet, and I think it's really dangerous, particularly for Korean people who don't know anything about Islam. Uh, if you listen carefully, I didn't make any equivalent. I was very careful not to do that. If you generalize, that's not something I did. It's something you did. What I did is I really listed those important figures that gave a huge mental input to humanity. I didn't say they did the same thing. I said they became religiously significant, these three people. And also I should say for the sake of balance that in the Orient it was Buddha and Lao Tzu and Confucius who actually set the stage for uh, social balance and uh, some kind of middle way and some kind of mind practice. And in the West it was Moses, Jesus and Muhammad that actually set the stage for a very monotheistic religious development. I don't think Mahomet had so much uh, influence on the West, I'm sorry, but I don't oh, think so. Oh. The Spanish back to differ. The Turks back to differ. I mean, uh, look, at the, way, look at the way Spain was influenced by Islam. In fact, in the Middle Ages, if there is no Islam, we would have lost 400 years of actual evolution. We would have no math, we would have no, no, uh, things like that. Mathematics Good. come from India, okay? Mm, Numbers come look from Look at the India. transmission line. Yeah, okay, so we, we can discuss for long about this. So. Uh, not necessarily. If you look at the grander picture, you see that over one billion people are following Islam today. We cannot say it was insignificant. It contributed a great deal to art, to religious views, it actually helped you know, integrate a lot of tribes into new societies. And if you look at the first six caliphs after Muhammad, especially the third, he had united Persia. Of course, they didn't like it, but it's another matter. Look at the third caliph. He, he was great. So if you want to marginalize any of these three, be my guest, but it's not going to work. <laughs> okay? You don't have to. You don't have to agree, and that's good. Feel free to disagree. More questions? Uh, I think human, every human have karma. And how do you think about uh, reducing karma? Uh, how do I karma think about what kind of karma? There is, uh, karma comes from past and uh, present, and uh, maybe in the future we make karma. So how do we to, to reduce karma? Okay, so first let me quote the Diamond Sutra. The Diamond Sutra says that the mind which is divided into past, present and future cannot get enlightenment. That's a really important point. Now if you see the essence of this teaching, then you also see that in this moment, past, present and future unite. Cause and effect unite. We experience it in this moment, whether it's a cause or an effect or both together. So how to reduce karma? Don't make it. Because we make karma in this moment. We suffer the consequences in this moment. You close the loop, you see that you are the alpha and the omega. You are the creator and you are the created at the same time. You make karma and you suffer it or enjoy the consequences. And that includes all of us, that includes the relationship between us, that includes our families, our societies. Karma doesn't stay with us. But since you asked individual question, I first gave you an individual-centered answer. So don't make anything. Don't follow your ideas. Don't want, don't hold, don't check, don't attach, don't identify. Then you don't make karma. Stay completely before thinking. Keep the mind which is before thinking in this total state of oneness, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And when you do that, you don't make karma. You only reflect what's coming. And you don't have any reaction to it. Those who deal with meditation and those who are practicing, you know what I'm talking about. 
If you don't meditate, it becomes like a mystery that this is possible. But it is possible and it is the direct manifestation of our Buddha nature. So it is possible not to make karma. You just have to stay very clear in this moment, refraining from making any dualities. Okay? Uh, normally, if we, if we want to make any karma, put, uh, some monks said, put it down. Say, put the same word over yours now. Teaching. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to use just put it down because it was my teacher's number one phrase, Sung San He always said, put it down. Yes, sir. So, <laughs> it's important not to be kind of just the parrot of your teacher. That's really, I think, fundamental. But he actually did spell it out. And when I say, or anyone says, put it down, then this is, what am I supposed to put down? So, if you spell it out and you say, don't make, don't hold, don't want, don't attach, don't check, that's the five attributes of putting it all down, okay? That's what it means. So he would say, put it down. <laughs> but it, it, it was his teaching, his gesture. More questions? Um, just before you talk about the fact uh, to keep out of the primordial duality, and you also spoke before about the wadu, and this kind of uh, primordial stupor, is it what you try to keep all, all day long, this kind of primordial stupor, where you have no duality and no anything is on suspense? Uh, it's interesting the way you termed it. First you said primordial duality, then you said primordial stupor, then primordial non-duality. Now which one do we want to use here? I think it, it's primordial because it's it's before any thought is formed. We agree on that. But the other three, which one of these three do you want to use? Um, I will say stupor. Stupor. Yeah. That's exactly the mistake. Okay. Because you haven't meditated yet. You what? You haven't really meditated with a huadu yet if you say stupor. No thinking doesn't mean stupor. This is when someone asks you the question, what are you? Uh -huh. And you have this kind of stupor first because you don't know how to answer. Well, stupor and don't know, they are different. Don't know is very clear. Clear like space, clear like a mirror. Stupor is just being stupid. It's as, it's as no, simple no, no, as no. that. No it's, it's, no, it's not stupid. It's like before you form a, a, a thought, before you form a soul, before you are able even to form a, a way of thinking. Then stupid. I kindly advise you to kind of reattain the meaning of stupor because it's not the way you define it. So if you say the mind which is before thinking and leave stupor aside, then we have no problem. But stupor for most people in this room means a very demented and limited state of mind. And we're not talking about that. We have serious English teachers in, in the audience, and I'm inviting them to have their own input if my definition of stupor is wrong. So it's not stupor. Let's put this aside. Meditation means you actually become free from any dualistic notions. In fact, you become free from the notion of self, and in that state of non-duality, your mind is clear like space, clear like a mirror. That's don't know. That's before thinking. And then we call this substance. Originally it has no name, no form, but we call this substance. And when you attain this substance, then you can perceive truth. The floor is brown, the aircon is on, the lights are bright. And then the next thing is function. You can act correctly. Somebody is thirsty, give them drink, somebody is hungry, give them food. So substance, truth and function, they are all lined up together. Okay? In that sense, it's complete. Is emptiness and substance the same thing? 
they point to the same thing, yes. Okay. More questions? As a person in a position to spread Buddhism, um, especially f to people who do not know anything about Buddhism, so <coughs> they are uh, the most beginners, mm -hmm. uh, so what would you say to them uh, so that they uh, have a, a glimpse of uh, awakening, a glimpse of uh, like a meditation mind, mm -hmm. see, which, because which is very attractive to anyone? Uh, you want me to sell Buddhism, huh? Or make it very popular? No, I cannot do that. <laughs> when people start to meditate and they see what they are carrying inside, they open up the lid and this hot soup of ramyon of their karma just hits them in the face, they would lose all kind of hope and they would be super disappointed. So instead, instead of trying to make meditation popular, which I cannot and I shouldn't and no one should, let's focus on the problem itself. Because if there is no problem, how could there be a solution that people accept? So first of all, if I wanted to make meditation popular, anybody could ask, why do you want me to meditate? Why? Do I do a special favor to you if I do that? No, but everybody has some kind of desire and anger, and based on that, they have problems. Either they have the desire to become immortal or beautiful, super beautiful, and then uh, have all the money and power in the world they want. So that's the kind of desire problem. The anger problem, they cannot get rid of something or someone and I want to kill my wife or husband or something. And this, this is the anger problem. So, really, how do I start? I start with, is there anything I can help you with? Is there a reason you are interested in Zen? And most people have. Most people have a reason why they are interested in Zen and I start with that so that we would outline an area where the person is open enough to reveal something which I don't want to know, but they want to impart on me in the hope of a solution. It's really like a doctor. My parents were doctors, I have the habit, you know, diagnosing problems. So, when that happens and people actually say that, oh, I have a problem, I have a question, I have something I want but I cannot get, then there is a fact. It's a fact. It's a fact of suffering. Then there is a cause, there's an end, and there's a way to end it. And then meditation becomes relevant, because the way to end suffering is not just the Noble Eightfold Path. I mean, remember, everybody does. The Noble Eightfold Path begins with something very interesting. Right, right, right. The right view, right conduct, right energy right livelihood, right speech, right action, right meditation. So what, how do you establish what is correct or right in this sense? If you don't meditate, if your mind doesn't become clear, you only have your own ideas about good or bad, right or wrong, and you actually don't see cause and effect, you don't see karma, and then you don't see what is right. Okay? So instead of seeing correctness, People have self-righteousness, and that self-righteousness is a killer. That's tremendously detrimental. That's our devolution into opinions instead of establishing facts. So, if people actually get it, and they get it, then the next step is that they would come again, and they would see the use of meditation in the Sangha and in their own lives as well. And if they are courageous enough to come, then they can see that use. They can see how balancing Sangha life is, how wonderful it is to meditate together. And uh, in our tradition, we have Sonmuntap, or Dharma combat for training your intuition. And that is done with Kongans. And that Kongan training is really just stripping your mind from all your delusions and all your karma and all your dualistic views because you cannot solve the kongas with them. So you have to find another tool than you would usually use, a non-dualistic tool. And that non-dualistic tool is your clear don't know mind. 
So if you get back to this clear mirror consciousness, you can solve the Kongan. If not, then it kind of itches you and bugs you and makes you frustrated, makes you angry at the teacher. So this kind of stuff, because you got the question which you cannot solve. It's very childish, but I went through it. Everybody does. So, I think suffering will make meditation popular. So, it's not such a long stretch. It does, but you have to have the necessary conduits. These conduits are teachers and sanghas and the teaching itself. So we have the instruments. We have the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. The teaching, the teacher, and the student's congregation. So I think uh, if we truly practice and believe in what we are doing, then we have those people who are ripe. And that's how the Buddha started teaching. In fact, it's a mythical exaggeration that, of course, he didn't want to teach first, but then Brahma came down from the highest heaven and actually requested that he would teach sentient beings, because there are few whose eyes are covered with just a little dust. What did that really mean? It meant deference on the Buddha's part, that he doesn't want to teach, he doesn't want to convert, he doesn't want to make meditation popular, because it's not his job. He already did it inside and kept doing it inside his own mental evolution or progress towards enlightenment. And when it's time to help other people with it, then it's really important to see the gateway where it is possible. So when that gateway opens, then the gate to meditation and enlightenment also opens. But if people are not honest enough if they are not sincere enough to actually see that something's not right, that we want to live forever, but we cannot. We want to be free and independent, but we cannot. We want to be perfect, but we cannot. If we don't see this, if we don't see our own problems, then we are not ripe. We are not ripe. Then more suffering is necessary. And we will. So if we are not ripe enough to be honest, then we will suffer more. And until then, it's not really, I don't want you to change yourself. You have to want to change yourself. And then when you do, suddenly help appears. Until I turned 24, I thought everything's fine. Turns out, it wasn't. It never was, but that, that's when I realized it. My whole world turned upside down. Within six months, Sung San Sunin visited Budapest, and trust me, I didn't even know him. And it was not me who invited him. But he was there, 1991 April, and I just joined previous year, September. That was fantastic. Big duck, and then the small duck starts to, oops, and then follow. It was wonderful. More questions? You have said about the six patriarch story, and when six patriarch ran away, and the Hemings uh, ran for catching up the Six Petrarch and uh, Six Petrarch put down the robes and bowels and the rock. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the Buddhism is not supernatural, so it is the meaning is the she as it is. So the robe is stick to a rock is a translation is a mistake. So it is not no form. So it, it means face only. So we must translate a little differently. So if we heard about uh, stick to rocks means it, uh, uh, non-believers think it's supernatural and the Buddhism is uh, some, not the religious, something, some misunderstanding. So we must translate that story, to stick to Slug it is differently. If you wish to translate that differently, no one will stop you. <laughs> but I also hope that you will let the other translations exist. Other questions? Um, when I meet unexpected emotion, what I should do? For example, uh, at 
for the first time I listened the word diamond straw. I expect the right word, but I feel just uh, dim sad. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to emotions. Your question started with emotions and ended up in the Diamond Sutra. Mm. Because you're a good Buddhist. <laughs> don't be a good Buddhist. Look inside and see what you find. That's good Buddhist. So Diamond Sutra is good, but it doesn't have to come here right now. At this point, the question really is, what do you do with emotions that suddenly attack you? That's the question. So, that's where the answer goes. <laughs> um, suppose you are on the Chiachol, the subway, and somebody comes up to you and immediately into your face from 10 centimeters, she shouts, Jesus loves you! <laughs> what do you do? You take a step back, right? Now that's what you should do with emotions that suddenly attack you. So you take a step back mentally and you don't say good or bad, right or wrong. And if you can truly reflect, then without any attachment, without any reaction, you can reflect back very clearly that Jesus loves you too. Then everybody is happy. Well, you certainly are. The other who couldn't convert you right away may not be. But if you don't have mind space, then your karma overwhelms you. It's like a small room with a lot of people in a heap and you are at the bottom. Not good. If you enlarge the room, then these people have more space. That means your karma is more visible and more spacious and can move around a little more. How do we do that? We do not judge. You judge, you make your mind narrow. Self-discipline, self-control, they are all good, but if they are based on dualistic judgments, you make your mind very narrow for the sake of someone or something. And that is a mistake. Being focused doesn't mean that you are narrow-minded. Cannot mean that. Or you don't have enough mind space to confront your karma and to confront your own emotions and thoughts. So your mind space should always be slightly bigger than the karma that it has to reflect. The room has always to be bigger than the amount of people that want to go in. So wide mind, open mind, clear mind, reflective mind, non-attached, non-dualistic mind, they are all going to the same place, same function. And then you just take one step back, what is this? With this question, you're already detached from it. And then you ask, where does this come from? And then you can see the cause and effect relationship just as well. Okay? So what is this? Where does this come from? These are the questions that can build a distance, but you don't lose sight. You don't lose your vision. You don't lose your narrative inside. And that vision, that insight, that changes you. Because suddenly you confronted your karma and you stopped running. Mostly we run. We want to escape. We want to cover it up. We want to be better. How can you become any better if you carry all that SHIT with you? You can't. So face it, open it up, it smells terrible, feels terrible, face it, and then by this seeing, by non-identifying with it, you take the energy out of it because eventually you see that you had made it. You'd made it somewhere down there in the past. And as insignificant it may seem that you detach from your karma and build some space and just reflect it, it is just as powerful. And if you start to practice it, it will become immensely useful. Acknowledge your responsibility that you made this. You just never saw this coming, but you made this karma. And once you acknowledge that, your clear mirror consciousness just starts to get back all the energy that you used to make that 
thing happen to make that emotion, that thought, that impulse, any kind of consciousness. Ultimately, our five skandhas in Korean, the O On, are all made like that. And that's why in the Heart Sutra, if you want a little sutra treatment, we can have that. The Heart Sutra says that originally the five skandhas are empty. That means it's created by ourselves. Everything, our body, our feelings, our perceptions, our impulses, all forms of consciousness. Or if you want the eight levels of consciousness, you know, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, conceptual thinking, judgmental mind, storehouse consciousness, it's also created by ourselves, coming from our true substance. So meditation can give you that insight and also a handle over it. And that handle is this moment. I think that makes meditation very popular. Okay. Did this answer your question? No, it didn't. Because <laughs> <laughs> the next step that you can do after detachment, non-identification and getting your energy back is to choose something else. Choose another path. Choose another way to relate to that person or act out certain emotions or receive certain emotions or form a different judgment once you have to judge, or stay non-judgmental completely. Now staying non-judgmental really makes you feel stupid. Where did I put my clever, distinctive, sometimes discriminating consciousness? We just don't use it. We just see things and people as they are without putting them into good and bad boxes. Now that's powerful. It really keeps you straight. So, then use this energy to live different. That's the other part that you needed to hear. And I don't think the answer is complete, but I stopped talking about it because it just makes it worse, okay? More, more questions? Is it necessary to have a, a certain level of education to put representation, to take some space between us and the representation? Or anybody can do it? Anybody can do it. So even someone who don't have a high level of education, right? Yes. How is it possible? By teaching them correctly. So it's okay. So you, it's like you replace school education with another no. kind of education. You don't. You add to it. First, we add learning techniques. That's what people really need, not just in high schools at universities, but also in primary schools. Most students, they cannot pay attention. Their mental entropy just results in such a defocus that they cannot even read one page continuously without doing something else. Okay? Attention deficit disorder. Familiar? Yeah. So that's how meditation can start as a learning aid. It should. In certain schools, higher class schools, it does exist. But it should be, I think, everywhere, strictly as a non-religious tool to improve your quality of attention. Number one. Number two, it can be extended into uh, mental techniques to solve problems. Whether it's a mathematical problem or an emotional problem, any kind of cognitive, physically related or purely mental problem, you can use these techniques like MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, or engaged Buddhism in prisons, etc., etc. Et so, plenty of applications. People have to see the use first. And when they do, they believe the results. Results can be apparent socially in a country within a generation. And it shouldn't be religious. The religion itself, which gave birth to it, or actually houses it, or just contains it, is very important and we should save it, our national treasures, whether it's material or immaterial, human, we have to list them, support them, keep them up. National treasure, treasures are important, whether they are trees or humans or temples. But, to actually spread the Dharma, people have to see its use and help 
uh, and blessings first. And we shouldn't want them to become Buddhists. And if that happens, then they see the practical aspect and then they might embark on meditation at a grander scale, which is not expected. It's not expected, it's offered. And if they want to study further, they can. They want to remain on their own turf, they can. So this kind of free will, the voluntary spirit, is stronger than anything. Why? I cannot teach liberation by taking away somebody's freedom. I cannot teach the lack of ignorant views by giving ignorant views to people. I'm also surprised because when you speak, you have a really political discourse. And it makes me think about the uh, uh, theolo liberation theology or something that, uh, like this they, they had in South America with uh, some Christian uh, priests. But I understand it because, I mean, religion can be used to oppress or liberate people. And, uh, if and you I, I can understand it. If you put religion and politics together, it's very dangerous. But I didn't talk about politics from a religious point of view. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, there was no holy justification or condemnation of anything. No, no. And also, you also say something very important. I think it's meditation is the key point. Yeah, it's the key point. But why? People who know me for many years in the audience, they know I never make political statements, and I, and I never take sides, and never just adopt any standpoints. But today, I was a little bit more explicit and open about it, historically and contemporarily as well. Why? Because if I don't do this, then I feel I mutilate myself. And the actual prompt for this in Korea, in this place at this time, was the Sewol Ho Ferry disaster. And I feel deeply shocked and dismayed what happened. I feel deeply frustrated about questions that were never answered and steps that were never taken. I feel grateful for this country, for this tradition, because that's what saved me from my own chaos and my own darkness. And if this country doesn't have leadership, doesn't have enlightened ways of solving problems, then I feel very, very sad. And I feel that I owe that much to actually ask questions and to reflect on certain things and certain events in a manner that these events would never repeat. That we would actually see leadership in correct action and relationship to the society which elected them. More questions? I have uh, one question. Uh, I feel suffering, I feel suffering um, that everything is always changing. So, what can I do for you about that? First, be very happy <laughs> that everything is changing because you are young. So, how can you be unhappy about changes yet? You're not getting old. Well, At this point, it's not happening. Maybe later, in a quarter of a century, you will feel that you're getting old. That's when changes will be, oh my God, what's happening to me? So, if you have a specific problem, then be specific. But changes, I don't think that's the issue right now. Go ahead. What bothers you? Come on. What is it? What? What kind of change do you mean as a problem? Environmental. Okay. Oh, okay. And uh, job. Or, um, you have a good job here. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with your job. But environment, yes. Yeah. We have a problem with that. Uh, and people, people's mind. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> ah, that's a huge topic. So environment, what, what can you do? Use less paper, yeah. save water, eat organic food. Don't make the big chains bigger because, because it does to your body what it does. And uh, on that note, I was very, very sad to see that in the last three years, in the streets and spaces of soul, there are more and more obese people. 
and that is an absolute fact by fast food consumption. So there's nothing wrong with fast food itself, but if you become addicted and overuse it, then you have a problem. It's another matter that fast food is actually made in a way that you could become addicted to it, but again, don't let's blame anybody. Keep the responsibility for ourselves within ourselves. So society in Korea is changing. Our relationship to the environment is also changing. Honestly, I don't know how Korea will be able to produce its own rice in even 15, 20 years. So far, it's, it's balanced. There's import also, but there's also export. So there is a balance. But if we devastate the environment for the sake of industry, if we keep doing that, we will lose more and more arable land. And Korea is a peninsula. You can fish a lot, but there's no way you, you can expand land. So we are losing arable land increasingly because we want more buildings, more infrastructure, more and more something which doesn't turn into food. Now you talked about people's minds. I think the only problem is the historic problem of, of ignorance. But ignorance is spreading in terms of zeros and ones very quickly. So you cannot stop it. In fact, it's okay that it's so fast. Korea is a pali pali country. <laughs> quickly, quickly country. And because of that, ignorance will spread very fast as well. Multil, materialism, also spreads very fast. And it's okay. Don't stand before the KTX. You lose. Okay? So, what is necessary? What is it that you can do? We talked about the environment, how you can save it. Now, how can we save people? Be there with your readiness to help them when the need arises. Be there with your compassion and wisdom to help them when their questions come. So get yourself ready, and it doesn't matter hair, no hair, Sunim or lay, English, Korean, doesn't matter. What matters is your heart, your mind, your clarity. And then these people will find you. In fact, they may even find you sooner than you think. So get started soon enough. And that's how you can help people. Don't mess with people's lives. Don't want to alter them from the outside. Don't want to know better. Don't judge them. Don't give them something that they don't feel that they need. And if you do that, then you can also be kind of invisible bodhisattva, which is great. Invisible bodhisattvas get far less hurt than very exposed bodhisattvas that are sometimes targets. Okay? So plenty to do. All right? Uh, I wish to uh, appreciate uh, Kim Kanjang Nim's hospitality and the hard work that he and all the helpers are doing in this international Son Center at Dongguk University. I sincerely hope that uh, we all vote for our own mental evolution and not devolve into something and someone that we don't want to be. And if we continue our path, then lifetime after lifetime, we can strive for awakening, attain greater clarity than before, and help all beings from suffering wherever we are, whatever world we are born in. Thank you very much.